Reconstruction hits, ends in 1877. So now the United States can return to these old policies. By 1890, three major events happen. One is Alfred Mahan's book, The Influence of Naval Power in History. In this book, written in 1890, uh, Mahan, who is a lecturer of the uh, Naval College, he argues that one of the reasons Britain and France were able to consolidate such a massive empire and power was their controls of the seas, and thus wanting the United States to have a stronger naval uh, presence for three aspects. One, the merchant navy to move goods around the world, a battleship navy to protect or deter from any enemies, and of course, coal stations. Back then the ships were uh, using coal, so by having a network of naval facilities around the world, this can facilitate the movement back and forth. In 1893, Frederick Jackson Turner submits his, his uh, frontier thesis, the, uh, and in this case, he argues that with the closing of the frontier in, in 1890 by the Census Bureau, the United States' westward migration has now be, have become complete. There is no more new frontier. And thus, he alludes to a sort of a, uh, an aggressive foreign policy. These two events, these two books that came out, are compounded and are supplemented by the Panic of 1893, where a lot of people lost their jobs, lost their homes, and the economists started looking at outside markets. And these two texts, both by Mahan and by Jackson Turner, start to influence national policies as far as how to improve the economics of this nation. By 1898, you started the Spanish-American War. And now, with these victories, especially done by seas in the Philippines and in Cuba, thus confirm the need for more naval power, and the United States now has achieved a third of Mahan's argument, the coaling stations in Guam, in the Philippines, in Cuba, in Puerto Rico. Now they are set to dominate the world. With the victories over Spain, thus confirming the need for the naval power, the United States is now a member of the Imperialist Club. They have gathered lands all over the world, and now they're moving forward with improving and modernizing their navy, with the transition from coal to petroleum, and also President uh, Theodore Roosevelt and the Great White Fleet, which is a goodwill tour, but also to showcase America's naval power, especially to Japan. All this effort now leads into the 1900s and the 1910s with the United States' eventual interest in the war. Having focused so much on naval power, the imperialistic tendencies, they forgot to, uh, to improve the foot soldier. So once the United States enters the war, how are they going to improve their numbers? One way is the draft. Now the draft is not new to the United States history. The draft has used before. However, many people were afraid of having a large standing army. People in the South remember how Reconstruction, they were forced by the military to do whatever they didn't want. Therefore, they were always a little wary of having a strong central army. Also, some immigrants were also not too happy being forced to join a military for a war that they probably didn't know anything about. But even the people that were in favor of this war in, 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 the Western, in Western Europe, these military purists were also against the draft. They felt that a volunteer army was the best because, of course, they volunteered. If you force somebody to join, they may not be happy. And this, from this forced conscription of soldiers dates back to the Civil War where there was a lot of unfairness, a lot of people, especially those that were wealthy, they were able to pay off so that their siblings or a family member did not have to attend and thus having a substitution. So all of these things will have to be taken consideration in order for this draft to Another exist. Another thing to consider that's also kept the United States from entering the war is the fact that is their actual personnel that the military had on um, as foot soldiers. Uh, on the eve of the declaration of war, which on um, on April six, there were only a hundred and twenty five thousand army regulars and only one eighty thousand as far as national guardsmen. That was the actual number of the total force the United States Army had at the time. Uh, so that was another thing that kept the United States from going to war. They were just not prepared. But some things happened. Some things changed that convinced the people to rally behind the war effort. 
One was the, the sinking of the Lusitania, which was in 1915, the year before the election. And still, President Woodrow Wilson was adamant about staying out of war and won the re-election in 1916. But then, in 1917, and early 1917, in January, you get the Zimmerman Telegraph. The Zimmerman Telegraph was a message sent to the to ambassador, the German ambassador in Mexico, that guaranteed not only victory but also would, uh, if Mexico would join war effort on the side of Germany, they would recoup all the lands or most of the lands that they had lost to the Americans just the prior uh, century. This, of course, infuriated uh, a lot of people in the United States. Not to mention that Germany was still engaging in submarine warfare. All these three things put together, finally, uh, the United States government decided, Woodrow Wilson, uh, along with them, decided it's time for action, and war was declared April 6, 1917.